Why IPv6? More addresses. In this video, we'll take a little deeper look than that and dive into the why and the wherefore. The story is simple. IP version 4 did not supply enough addresses for the world, and IP version 6 does. In this video, we'll flesh that out with these two main sections of the chapter. Once you're to the end, stick around. As always, I'll give you advice for those of you that have the books about how to best use the book in conjunction with this and related videos, and then I'll talk about the review activity related to this video. By way of introduction, I've been making networking learning content for most of my career. For instance, I've written all of the official cert guides for CCNA from Cisco Press, like the covers you see here. I've created lots more titles as well, both books and videos and software products. However, these days, I'm all about keeping the CCNA cert guide up to date whenever it revs and building this YouTube channel. And you can help. What can you do? Make a habit of clicking the like button. That's probably the number one way to help. It's always appreciated. Thanks for doing that. Now, let's talk about IP version 6 and why all those addresses really helped versus IP version 4. IPv4 address exhaustion is the name given to this problem that cropped up by the early 90s. By design, the internet was supposed to work by having every host that connected to it to use a unique IP version 4 address. There was a process to make that happen but it was pretty clear that we were going to run out of unique numbers to use. So let me talk you through that problem a little bit and review a few concepts about IP version 4, because all of this drove the need for IP version 6. So you've probably seen numbers like, hey, if it, the number begins between 1 and 126 in the first octet of an IPv4 address, it's part of class A. By the way, all those that begin with 0 and 127 are reserved for some reason. And guess what? That's about half, or that is half, of the IP version 4 address space. These numbers taken up by unicast addresses in class A. Now, unicast means the addresses are used by one host rather than multiple, for instance, with multicast. So that's about half the address space. Then there was another chunk reserved for class B addresses, another chunk for class C unicast addresses. And you can see the relative sizes for the numbers of addresses. Those took up seven eighths of the available addresses with IP version four. There were a couple of other classes that were allocated. And there you go, there's your entire IP version four address space, which literally totaled a little over four billion addresses. But since we only use seven eighths or so for unicast addresses, it was a little under 4 billion addresses available as unicast addresses. Now there was a process attached to this where it wasn't just willy-nilly you give out random IP version 4 addresses. A company or organization would apply for and receive an allocation of a block of consecutive IP version 4 addresses. These were called class A, B, and C networks. So a huge company, like hugest in the world kind of place, would get an allocation of a class A network for instance, maybe all addresses that begin with one. That would be one of the Class A networks. Now, that one Class A network has over 16 million addresses. Why? Because we can use any number between 0 and 256 in the second and the third and the fourth octet. So how many combinations is that? Well, it's 256 options times 256 times 256. And if you do that math with your calculator, it comes out to be over 16 million unique numbers. So not only were these networks huge as far as the number of available addresses, it was bigger than most organizations really needed. In fact, even the organizations that got them, they were too big. They were wasteful. Then there were class B networks that a lot of companies got that were early to the game with the internet, where the first two octets were defined for you. That is, all your addresses in this case would begin 128.1, and then anything between 0 and 255 in the third and fourth octet, which gave you 256 times 256 possible combinations or about 65,000 addresses. Great size for a fairly large company. Then there were class C networks for which the first three octets had the same value for all addresses in the network. It gave you a whopping 256 numbers possible. So these were typically too small to be useful, which made everybody want one of these class B networks, which drove demand there. To make sure everybody used unique address blocks, there was a registration process, an allocation process. 
IANA owns the address space, that organization, and they then worked with five regional internet registries, RIRs, spread across the globe, Africa, Asia Pacific, North America, and so on. So the process would be a company would apply for an allocation of some addresses and receive those, and they could receive those like company one and two from Afrinic, for instance, and get those directly from the RIR. Over time, ISPs got into the game where they would get an allocation or assignment from an RIR and then turn around and allocate those out to their customers as a convenience for customers. So you might get it your address block from your RIR, or you might get it from your internet service provider. With that process of assigning a class A, B, or C network to anyone that came along and applied and, and justified it, it was pretty clear by the early 1990s when the internet was commercialized that, hey, the world was going to run out of these public, unique IP addresses, IP version 4 addresses. So the original plan was failing. We had the address exhaustion problem by the early 90s, not literally 1990, but by the early 90s. So there were two plans, basically. One was a short-term plan to shore up IP version 4, and one was to replace it with a new version of the protocol, IP version 6. So just a few words about fixing IP version 4 was this fix was to use something called NAT and CIDR, which weren't used before. They were created and they succeeded. And the way they succeeded was they greatly reduced the rate of consumption of the available remaining public IP version 4 addresses. No longer were people assigned entire class A, B, and C networks, for instance. But this video isn't about that solution. But even with this great solution that was hugely successful with Nat and Cider, eventually IANA, it ran out of IP version 4 addresses to give RIRs to use. RIRs like Aaron and Lacknick ran out of addresses to give to their customers. By the way, I mentioned Aaron because it's North America, and Lacknick was the last of the five to run out. So think of the 2015 and 2020 dates as when these organizations ran out of addresses to give to companies that came along. So we're out. So concurrent with that, the internet community came up with these IP version 6 RFCs by the mid-1990s that were meant to replace IP version 4. So the idea would be that we'd get comfortable with it, we'd start running both protocols in a style called dual stack, and eventually you'd get to the point where more and more hosts would use both protocols, they would prefer to use version 6, eventually you could start turning off IP version 4 on those. So there would be a fairly slow migration, comfortable migration to IP version 6, and that has been happening over these decades. IPv6 helps solve this IP version 4 address exhaustion problem by using a huge address space. For instance, it uses a 128-bit long address. And at first glance, you might say, oh, that's four times wider than a 32-bit IP version 4 address, and it is. But as far as numbers of addresses, IP version 4 gives us a theoretical max of 2 to the 32nd addresses, which comes out to a rounded 10 to the 9th addresses. With IP version 6, it's 2 to the 128th, which comes out to about 10 to the 38th, 10 to the 29th times as large. And it's just hard to get your head around that. So let me spend a minute with you getting an idea of the scale. Think of the Earth and let's draw a grid with each square kilometer mapped out. There are 10 to the 8th square kilometers on the surface of the Earth rounding generously, all right? That means with IP version 4 addresses, 10 to the 9th of those, we get 10 per square kilometer. So imagine yourself standing in the middle of a field and you think it's about a kilometer large and where you might locate your 10 IP version 4 addresses if that's what you had for that kilometer. They're, they're kind of spread out, right? Now, IP version 6 with 10 to the 38 available addresses, theoretical max based on the math, well, it's 10 to the 30th addresses per square kilometer. If you tried to write those addresses down on paper, you wouldn't be able to fit them all in the square kilometer. In fact, to, to kind of bring it down a little bit more, think instead of a grid of one kilometer squares, think of a grid of nanometer squares across the planet, smaller than you can see. We've still got a million IP version 6 addresses per square nanometer of the surface area of the Earth. Yes, it's... It's a ridiculously large number of addresses. 
or to bring it home to us humans for a moment, you know, we've got a little less than uh, 10 billion humans on the earth. So rounding, let's call it 10 to the 10th humans on earth. We got 10 to the 9th addresses. Um, it says they're rounding to the nearest power of two, but it's, it's basically one IP, IP version four address for every two humans or so. Whereas with IP version six, it's uh, 10 to the 28th IP version six addresses per human on the planet right now. A ridiculously large number. So let's talk about address allocation for a moment instead of that theoretical discussion. Each company would apply for and be assigned a global routing prefix, it's called. It's like a class A, B, or C network in IP version 4 in that it's globally unique. No other company should use those same addresses. Like company 1 gets this assignment of all addresses that begin with 3 fox 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 colon 0 1 1 1. IP version 6 addresses are hexadecimal. It's four digits, colon, four digits, colon, four digits, and so on for 32 hex digits long. Now, this nomenclature up here, we'll explain more about it later, but basically this says the first 32 bits, which is the first eight hex digits, must match this number. So all addresses that begin, 3 fox 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 0111. Now, if you took that prefix and then said, I'm going to subnet it to deploy it and use it, similar idea that you do with IP version 4, and you use the normal kind of subnetting plan you would typically use, you'd create two to the 32nd subnets on paper with two to the 64th addresses each. <laughs> yeah, it seems a bit ridiculous, doesn't it? That That's a lot. Over 4 billion subnets, each of which has a really, really large number of possible addresses. So far more than you're going to need. Now, company two may not need or want to get such a large assignment. They might get this prefix. This means the first 40 bits must match whatever in binary this hex number represents. 40 bits equals 10 hex digits. Translated, all addresses that in hex begin 3 fox 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 0 2 2 2 2 2. That's their global routing prefix. Well, it turns out if you subnet like normal, you'd end up with 2 to the 24th subnets of that same 2 to the 64th size. By the way, that's a little over 16 million subnets, still plenty big. Or maybe a smaller block like this slash 48 prefix, meaning 12 hex digits. So all addresses that begin with these 12 hex digits would be unique to this company, and they'd end up with 2 to the 16th subnets. Only 65,000 and change subnets. In their case, each of size 2 to the 64. So large address blocks that they can sub, then subnet and deploy. And just to drive home the mass, just the sheer size of this, let's think about that traditional Class A network from IP version 4 in the original plan. With a Class A network, the default prefix length was slash 8. That is 255-000 for the mask. And if you used a nice, easy mask for all subnets of slash 24 with IP version 4, you would have created 2 to the 16th or 65,536 subnets of probably a large enough size to be useful, right? But if I compare that to the smallest block from the pre previous page, the slash 48 example at the bottom left of the page, well, you also created 65,536 subnets, two to the 16th of them. By the way, they're two to the 64th big, so ridiculously large number of addresses per subnet. So the small one in my previous example, which is easy to get with IP version 6, gives you just as many subnets as you would get with a typical class A network in IP version 4. Then with that slash 40 block, there's your 16 million rounded number of subnets in that slash 32 block, the upper left in that previous slide, you're roughly 4 billion subnets. If we're giving out these huge blocks of addresses to each company, are we going to run out of the number of prefixes available? Well, the answer is no, but let's talk through that for a moment. First off, these public address blocks of unique addresses, unique across the internet in IP version 4, we call those an IP network or a classful IP network or a class A, B, or C network. With IP version 6, we call it a global routing prefix. Same idea, just a different term. Now, in terms of the numbers of these things, with IP version 4, the number of these was predetermined by plan. 
So there were 126 Class A networks. Class B, there were two to the 14th of them, so it's 16,384. In Class C, there was two to the 21st of those, and that's a little above 2 million of those. They were pretty small, but there were over 2 million of them. Now, what about IP version 6? Well, it turns out there's no predefined plan. So we can play a little game here where I say, hey, let's pretend that there was a plan that predetermined the number of these global routing prefixes. Let's say, for instance, the plan was all global routing prefixes had a slash 32 prefix length. That's like that huge allocation that we talked about in the upper left hand of that earlier figure that created so many subnets. Well, if we did that for the entire available address space as of today, turns out that would have created about half a billion, 500 million or so of these globally unique global routing prefixes. Well, it's hard to imagine we would need that many, but there they'd be. Now, this is a theoretical exercise, but let's just say instead of saying, hey, the, the perfect size is slash 32, all the assignments will be slash 32s. If we instead said, hey, how about the slash 40? That's the medium size in my earlier example. And that would have created 100 billion of those unique blocks of addresses to use in the internet, or if we had picked slash 48 as the perfect size, well, that would have created, you know, 30 trillion or so unique blocks. So you can see there's plenty of these to go around. And oh, by the way, all this math is based on the current practices that uses barely over 10% of the IP version 6 address space for this, leaving lots of room for growth. So there is indeed plenty to go around. The nice thing is, though, the process is still the same. IANA still owns the address space. They work with the same five regional registries who work with ISPs. You can get your assignment either directly from an RIR or from an ISP. So for you book readers, you'll find similar content in Volume 1, Chapter 25, Section 1. It's called Introduction to IP Version 6. You could probably get away with skipping that section or reading it if you watch this video and the related video. So what's that related video? It's the second in this list. It's one that talks about comparing version 4 and version 6 for the core protocols for routing and routing protocols and that kind of thing. Once you've watched both the videos, make sure to check out the terminology mind map for IPv6. Uh, it's linked in the description to this video. Thanks for sticking with it till the end, folks. As always, appreciate you being with me. Likes, comments, and shares are great ways to help me with the channel. It's much appreciated. Of course, if you're new, hey, welcome. Click subscribe if you're interested and think you might want to watch coming videos. So thanks for hanging out. Talk to you soon.